we have put up a banner saying this is a 50th anniversary of ICS. That's a slightly fictional uh, construction <laughs> on our part. It's the 50th anniversary of the China Study Group, which was just a discussion group on the lawns of uh, Sapro House in those days. But nonetheless, we date ourselves from those wonderful days of uh, chrysanthemums and sunshine and expansive lawns and bad coffee and good, con <laughs> and good conversation. So um, now, as you know, ICS's major, or if you like, um, default uh, focus is and must, must be on international relations, uh, that is uh, China and India, China and the world, on India-China relations, which is a topic which um, will always occupy us uh, for geopolitical and increasingly economic reasons. But we have also, as a collective, always aimed to have a broader view uh, in our research pro uh, publications, like in China Report, and uh, also to be interdisciplinary in our way of going about things. That is, we have a space for the humanities and languages, and for the uh, applied and theoretical social sciences. Uh, we also want to feel that we have self-consciously a location in India from which we can leverage a different sort of comparative studies <coughs> to those which normally go under the, under the title of comparative studies. That is, when people in New York or London are doing comparative India-China studies. They do it from one more distant perspective. Here are two countries they're comparing, or two developing <coughs> countries, or two, you know, uh, and so on. But we are located in, a, um, in an envir environment, a shared environment in Asia. And with many, uh, not in, in the Asian neighborhood. And it's very important that we look at development from, uh, from our Indian location, not only just geopolitically, uh, because we're in India and because China's a neighborhood and because we have problems, but because we share so much else, including perhaps the possibility of joint, uh, shared perspectives uh, within the social sciences and humanities. Now, uh, it's quite appropriate that our, uh, that our celebration of our fictive 50th anniversary should include uh, an event which comes under what we've called our Comparative India-China Studies uh, Unit, and uh, particularly that it has it, uh, the one that we are uh, presenting today is the Comparative Health Studies Programme headed by our assistant director, Madhurima Nandi, who will be known to many people here, both as an ICS person and her sterling work from her student days in the field of social medicine and community health. Uh, in partnership with uh, Dr. Rama Baru, uh, who must have been her supervisor many, many years ago, and um, they have brought a very unique interdisciplinary, they represent a unique interdisciplinary institution. <coughs> um, the uh, comparative studies uh, is India and China is increasingly modulated by a global perspective. And I think that without taking the words out of the mouths of the two authors who are going to speak and to uh, introduce their book, we are looking not only at a comparison of two countries, but a comparison of two countries within a global context in which, of course, there are other players. And this is, the, uh, this is where, uh, what the uh, book is addressed to. Now, uh, sooner or later, I, uh, I'm very sorry that Professor Manaranjan Mahanti has not been able to be here, but um, I've been tasked with reading out, I shan't actually read out, but uh, paraphrasing his uh, 
very nice forward to this book, which uh, will be put uh, will put things into perspective. But before we come to that, uh, we'll treat him as he is on the panel as the first panelist, which will be me, uh, using his words. Um, I'd like the two authors, uh, Rama uh, first and then Madhurima, uh, to uh, introduce the book. Now, Dr. Ra uh, Professor Rama Baru, I think you all know, is a professor of long standing at the uh, uh, center of the center. Yes, Centre for um, uh, uh, community, Social Medicine and Community Health, I always get them the long way round, uh, who has taught there for many years and been a core member of their faculty. Uh, she's had a special focus on India, on social epidemiology and the political economy of health, women's health, research methodology and so on. But recently, as she will probably tell you, she has been looking at comparative health studies and began with China. She's worked, of course, in the, for the Ministry of Health and Family Planning, Family Welfare and Planning Commission, Population Commission, and the National Bureau of Health Mission, uh, along with uh, Professor Imrana Kadir at my side. She has been the editor of CSDS. Social Development Report 2014, Challenges of Public Health. So, uh, Rama, beginning with you, um, please tell us what the book is from your, your point of view. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have all of you present for the release of this co-authored book on commercialization of medical care in China. As uh, Patricia said, that uh, this interest of comparative studies and looking specifically at China actually began when I was a student, and my teacher is here, Imrana, when she used to teach us the history of public health. We used to, she used to talk about what happened in China, We're talking about two very different political regimes at that time, the, both the Western history of public health as well as the Chinese. And then when I later joined the center as a teacher, I started teaching a course on comparative health systems. And it is there that I started trying to look at China once again. And the other day I was talking to Madhurima and I said, you know, we occupy a very unique position from the center as China watchers in public health. So I think I would like to use that uh, title to describe our position in the Institute of Chinese Studies as well. What this book has really tried to capture is the dramatic transformation of China's healthcare from its socialist past to a commercialized one. From an entirely state-operated health system from the 1949 to 78, it was commercialized into a very active, with a very active presence of the private sector over a period of time. The process of commercialization has very profound consequences for the China's national health system in terms of health equity and costs of care. And the process of commercialization has fundamentally altered how public institutions think and behave. We hope that this book will encourage more researchers to study the social and human development aspects of China's resurgence as a global economic power. As Professor Mohanty has aptly put it, the success of China's growth and the success trap both coexist in the Chinese context. And if anything, the case of commercialization of health in China is really bringing very vividly the success trap. The recent Indian scholarship has focused mainly on China's economy, strategic and security implications of its rise as a global power. While these are relevant, it is equally important for Indian researchers to engage with social security, including health, 
old age and welfare. This book is an outcome of a research study we, that was funded by the Indian Council of Social Science Research. It is based on extensive review of published studies, reports, data sets, in-depth interviews with Chinese scholars and policy makers, and observations based on extensive field visits to medical institutions. The writing of this book is a testimony to, to several partnerships at different levels. I first have to say that it's the Center of Social Medicine and JNU that gave us the freedom for academic creativity. To ICS for accepting China watchers in the area of China studies. Our Chinese colleagues for their openness and friendship and for their many new collaborations. And to my co-author Madhurima for her intellectual and personal friendship. This book could have never happened without the students of the center and this co-production of knowledge over a period of time having to teach students of several generations. They actually challenged me to read and develop the interest in China and made my years at JNU very meaningful. We therefore dedicate this book to the successive generations of the students of the Center of Social Medicine and Community Health. I now invite my co-author, Madhurima Nandi, to give you an outline of the book. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. The book release of my first book, co-authored with my supervisor, mentor, and colleague now, Professor Rama Baru. I thank the chair, uh, Professor Patricia Obras, for making time to come here, Professor Imrana Kadir and Professor Madhulika Banerjee, who have accepted to be the panelists and have gone through the book in detail. And we expect some very hard comments from them. Um, taking from what Professor Baru has just outlined, the book chapters, as you can see, are in a logical order. And a continuum of commercialization flows through these chapters as a concept and as a process. The chapters show how health service systems have restructured over a period of time and in phases. The process of commercialization is not a recent phenomena in China. It began immediately after decollectivization post-1978. In the initial two decades, this was most pronounced in the rural areas. It saw the collapse of the cooperative medical scheme. We see the continuum of this process through phases, mainly that of commercialization of public hospitals, where we see the introduction of internal markets, the entry of private capital, both domestic and foreign, and the rise of the for-profit in hospitals, pharma, medical devices, and insurance and complex arrangements that happen thereafter through partnerships. Within public hospitals, we see the market forces within and outside, their interrelationship and how these processes over a period of time have altered the values, the behavior, and culture of these institutions. We outline here four sub-phases of the public hospital reforms and the debates between the pro-market and pro-state ideologues. And these come out through the chapter of the public hospital reforms. Much of the literature of commercialization focuses on public hospitals as they are the major providers of care. Here we also analyze the rise of the private medical care as a continuum of commercialization. The private sector also emerged at the primary level with decollectivization. Market socialism facilitated the growth of the private sector and allowed domestic and foreign capital to enter the health sector. Interestingly, the history of the entry of private capital into medical care is that of an American investor in the early 1980s, first into the medical device market and then the hospital sector. This is detailed in the book. The most recent phase is marked by joint ventures between Chinese and foreign capital and free trade zones in the first tier cities. This process of commercialization is provided with the necessary conditions for initiating partnerships, public and private, which is a more recent phenomenon, a continuum to the process again of commercialization. PPPs are also a step towards transiting from commercialization to privatization. Some scholars also see this as setting the stage towards corporatization. They see the motivations towards corporatization as deeply embedded in the hospital sector. 
we see a mix of public financing and private provisioning and in some cases private financing and public provisioning and emergence of complex structures of provisioning <coughs> to the entry of big capital and their consolidation leading to what Relman has called the medical industrial complex and the context of the US but we see this now in China. The biggest challenge that the Chinese government faces is the question of equity and it has been something it has been attempting to address since the late 1990s. There have been efforts for course correction but the logic and continuum of commercialization has restricted this rectification almost making it irreversible. In our conclusion we borrow as Professor Baru also mentioned, from Professor Manoranjan Mohanty's idea of the success story and the success trap, two sides to the experience of Chinese liberalization. What has happened to the Chinese health sector, in a sense, exemplifies the success trap. To conclude, I quote the last sentence from our book, which is food for thought for developing countries, especially like ours, that the Chinese health Chinese case highlights the fact that high public expenditures on social insurance but limited investments in public institutions has meant that costs are going up and inequities continue to be a challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madhuri Man. I think we can go back to our original uh, um, program because I see now that uh, Professor Sangamitra Acharya has joined us. She's the chairperson of the Center for Social Medicine and Community Health. Uh, Mr. Ashok, Ambassador Ashok Khan is here. So let's, um, we will have the icing before the cake now, <laughs> the rest of the cake. Please, please. Uh, yes, can you, do, do you bring it in? And, uh, We begin now with the uh, panelists' comments, and I am no longer Professor Oberoi, I'm uh, Professor Mahant. <laughs> um, now, uh, Professor Mahanti has written a very lucid 
uh, a lovely uh, foreword to this, this book. He begins by looking back some, uh, in fact, exactly 20 years uh, to a, a double, no, a triple 50 anniversary. Uh, Indian independence, Chinese liberation, and the establishment of India-China diplomatic relations. And uh, for that, uh, on that triple anniversary, uh, ICS uh, held um, a conference uh, on 50 years of development, comparative development of India and China. It was steered by GPD, G GP Deshpande, and Alkar Acharya, and the book came out, out of out of that was released on that um, called uh, Crossing a, a Bridge of Dreams India, India and China in Comparative Perspective or at 50. And I think that was the beginning of this sort of work. And the beginning he also says in more ways than one, well he, uh, he says it, uh, that it was the beginning of uh, India and China completing 50 years as free interactive neighbors. I reckon that's a nice phrase we can save up for using other places. Now, in that book, there was uh, uh, one, one chapter uh, which was entitled The State, Human Development, and Human Development, colon, Health and Education. And that was written by three then much younger uh, uh, faculty members of JNU who may not realize that they were referred to sometimes as the three witches. <laughs> <laughs> or in, <laughs> in, in, a, in a, you know, stirring a big bowl. And or uh, sometimes as three lady Turks <laughs> because they were, they were fighting girls. So uh, they, they were uh, Alka herself in international relations, uh, Rama Baru, and sitting in, the, uh, in social medicine, and sitting at the back now, Gita Numbers. And this single chapter out of about 18 or 20 in that book has been something that has, we've lived with ever since and really wanted to expand. So, Professor Mahanti refers back to this as two growing points in our, in, in our interest and agenda on understanding China better. As we said, the health, uh, uh, the health sector has been uh, um, you know, doing very well indeed, and education is also something which we have been addressing, intermittently addressing, addressing at all levels from primary to tertiary education. So, um, uh, Professor Mahanti uh, um, outlines basically what has already been said, that the focus here is on what is called the reform uh, period of uh, uh, China's development, and the common challenges that, uh, that everyone uh, uh, encounters now under globalization particularly the question of market forces, uh, the, the question of access to medical care, uh, the corrective actions by the state and whether they work or they don't work, <coughs> things like subsidies and insurance, and um, the uh, looking towards the future, what is missing, and towards the future. Uh, he also wanted for training Chinese for management and in professional uh, specializations. And therefore the Chinese themselves today bring in the models which are totally unsuited perhaps. So I, I can just go on but I would like to stop here. Um, I would like to say that what you need to work is on the sociology of this process. Uh, I know it's a difficult task, but you have now friends in China who can work out that how is it that there are regions in China 
the eastern provinces so denied that it is all focused at some place. How is it that it's only the employed in the industry which get the benefits and agriculture and other residents, especially the, uh, the migrants, are getting in badly? And how is it that both in India and China, the middle class is completely taking us in a direction that is disastrous? I'll stop it. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Imrana, for those very, very thoughtful, wise comments with a little pitch. Yep. Uh, now I'd like to call on uh, Madhulika Banerjee. She's the teacher of politics in Delhi University, uh, works <coughs> in the sphere of political economy, public policy, comparative politics. But I first got to know her, actually, when she was working on her PhD thesis, which for a political scientist in the University of Delhi was on a very unusual theme called Power, Knowledge and Medicine, Ayurvedic Pharmaceuticals at Home and in the World. That book is uh, So, um, are you right with the mic? I'm trying to make it work. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Professor Oberoi, and uh, thank you very much to Rama and Mathurima for asking me to uh, speak on this, uh, on their very, very exciting book today. Uh, I have to say, since uh, Professor Oberoi referred to uh, the PhD I did, it is a uh, uh, very lonely out there because <laughs> if you are one person working on medicine and the rest of your discipline has no clue what you're trying to say, what you're trying to do, then it's friends like Rama and Ritudi and Sangamitra mm -hmm. and, and indeed <coughs> Professor, both the professors overall who have been, uh, you know, the so, uh, interlocutors uh, and people with whom one has uh, grown so much having learned in communication and in, uh, um, in uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, a, a sort of entire academic orientation that I've had with all of them. And I have to say, since this is an afternoon of uh, teachers and supervisors being together, let me take my little claim as well, because uh, Professor Kadir was uh, one of the uh, examiners for my thesis, that thesis that I did, and I haven't forgotten that. Uh, and the person who is absent uh, today, and everyone is missing very much, and it would have made a big difference had he been here, Professor Mohanty was indeed the one who supervised my thesis uh, at uh, Delhi University. So we are all a very, very small, incestuous uh, <laughs> circle over here. But I hope uh, not uh, a, a circle that is uh, incestuous to a purpose, because um, uh, this is a field which, uh, which requires uh, people from different backgrounds to come in with their disciplinary understanding, and uh, to build understanding of contemporary developments, which uh, are, even if we are focused on medicine, uh, we recognize that so many different uh, inputs are required. And so it's, uh, it's a very fascinating journey for those of us who do come from certain kinds of training to work on these areas. Um, and uh, this, this kind of an occasion is a wonderful opportunity to exchange notes on that. Um, I was uh, uh, very, uh, I'm, I'm very honored that uh, Rama asked me to speak on the book. Uh, also, I was very nervous, I have to say, because um, I do not uh, teach regularly on public health and medicine. So uh, one doesn't have that kind of uh, felicity with the information, with the analysis, uh, that you know, this book is so very rich in. And um, it was a relief that Professor Kadir spoke before me, uh, because she's actually spoken about uh, s uh, the most important, um, you know, uh, debates in the book, uh, wh which located as a very significant intervention and contribution to the public health uh, uh, discourse, uh, public health debate, and uh, of course, locating it in the India-China comparative uh, framework, which 
uh, is, I think, very, very important for us uh, today. It always has been, but today more than ever. Um, and I, I, I learned a great deal uh, from this book. And um, one of the things that uh, uh, it, it I, you know, brought home to me is that today when we are debating so much on universal health care vis-a-vis -vis universal health coverage, I think that this is a book that brings home the reality on the ground in one very significant national nation state context where this debate is being played out and therefore affords a very important set of insights for us to understand uh, when we are talking about public health, do we or do we not focus, uh, do we or do we not target it towards universal health care or do we cover, uh, focus on universal health coverage? Um, the way Professor Kadir has laid it out, um, I think, really addresses those concerns um, very significantly. So I will not uh, dwell on that. Um, I had also uh, thought, and I did look closely at Professor Mohanty's book, uh, before, but that's a book that has come a few months ago, and uh, uh, it uh, proved to be a happy occasion for me to read both, actually, at once. And uh, of course, like everyone else, uh, I was struck with uh, his argument about the success trap of reform as uh, uh, with respect to the success story. And to me too, it really did seem that the argument that you're making in the book is so much about a, a very important success story in one sense of uh, public health and uh, medical care, you know, um, uh, uh, full of the kinds of contradictions that uh, Professor Kadhi pointed out, but nevertheless, uh, they are certainly part of one kind of a success story, but it's precisely because it is in a certain frame of reference uh, that it becomes a success trap as well. And I'd like to talk about that uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a little bit. I think that this uh, book is important and I just, one of the things that I think is very important because it in so much fascinating detail tells a story that all of us have had some kind of general understanding about. But the richness of the detail of the information which has been put in a certain analytical frame is what I find most important in this book. And it's something that I know that I can definitely recommend to any scholar who's trying to make sense of contemporary China. And that's no mean task sitting in India, as uh, you know, you, you did say, Rama, in the beginning. And I think that this is very important uh, to do at this point in time. Um, there are two things, though, that I would like to talk about, um, you know, stemming from what little understanding I have of the concepts and the frame that they have used. One is, in fact, I begin, you know, where Professor Mohanty uh, makes his argument about the very idea of development in which all these reforms are being carried out and for whom, you know, and, and it raises the question as to for whom is this development being done uh, and who therefore, you, we can ask the question, uh, who does it benefit? And uh, it's in that context of development, the idea of development or the conceptual frame of development in which we need to understand the question of commercialization. This is something that I've done a little bit of work on myself. So I will focus on a concept that I understand and I think I can speak a little bit about. And I think that what is important about the process that we understand as commercialization is that it has a certain trajectory. Commercialization is, according to this larger idea of development and this particular trajectory, Commercialization is about generating profit through certain kinds of arrangements of uh, certain kinds of political economic arrangements which are about certain systems of production, certain systems of consumption which are going to generate profit and the overall understanding of this particular kind of commercialization is that because it leads to profit it is bound to 
lead to welfare at some point in time. Now, it's I think that when we are wrestling with all these uh, ideas, when we are wrestling with all these policies and all the information that we have, we are doing it in the context of this particular trajectory of commercialization, which is received wisdom from what Professor Monty calls the European uh, uh, European uh, frame of industrialization. And we've taken it on lock, stock, and barrel, in which you know, the critique of this, of course, comes from Europe itself from the 19th century onward. That We all are familiar with that critique as well. But I think now we are also in a position to question the fact that if we are going to talk about production, distribution, and gain, whether profit or welfare, from a particular system of production and distribution, that there can be other pathways to commercialization, which I think we are not clearly exploring. And the tragedy is that whether it is a so-called liberal democracy like India, or indeed a communist experiment like that of China with you know, a certain kind of socialism until 78 and then market socialism after that. In each of these, I think that one of the uh, tragedies is that we, are, we have not had the gumption to explore the possibility of a different pathway of commercialization. Now, I'm calling it commercialization simply because that is the dominant paradigm and in which all of this is being understood. When we eventually play it out, it may not be commercialization because now we associate it very narrowly with profits and gains that are inevitably going to accrue to a very small part of the population. Uh, we like to call them the middle class, but they are the elite of the populace, whether in China or in India. In China, less so. There are more in that middle class than in India, perhaps, but certainly not the majority. As even you know, the the the, the communist ideals uh, of China were actually aiming towards, or indeed the liberal democratic ideals of India were uh, focused on. So I think that uh, this actually affords us an opportunity to think about all the different models that you, know, you have so closely examined to see whether there are at all any experiments, any, any initiatives, any ideas with, looking, with working on models <coughs> of healthcare, of medical care, which actually do generate certain kinds of surpluses and are, have the capacity to benefit a large number of people. We think, we have been taught to think that these are paradoxical. This is a paradoxical statement. It cannot happen. But, you know, after all, the frame of industrial, uh, uh, of, of an industrialized society and its political economy of production and distribution and consumption came to us from a certain frame in Europe. So it had a certain context. When it, it is deployed, in contexts like in India and China, surely there are there is a potential, there are possibilities for it to be spelt out in different ways. And is it possible that we have a different kind of collective action? And I'm a political scientist. For me, collective action and action of communities towards and with all the complexities that uh, collective action implies, as well as communities imply. There is a potential for that to yield different kinds of trajectories. Uh, of 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 uh, a sustainable uh, uh, political economy. I do not like to call it sustainable development because I personally think that sustainable development is an oxymoron, and I understand why Professor Kadir was uncomfortable with using the term. So I think that when we address ourselves to uh, an issue as significant as this, there is a real potential for us to explore the possibility of different pathways to sustainability which are actually uh, able to generate a certain kind of surplus and able to reach the benefit of that production economic system, the production distribution system, to a large number of people that earlier forms did not do. I'm just relating it to the idea that, you know, every chapter when you're describing every phase, 
you know, you remind us that it is when collective agriculture, collectivized agriculture broke down, and the surpluses that came from that those agricultural, uh, the, those collectivities, the communes, uh, those surpluses broke down, that the financial support for the public health systems, the CMS, that had been put in place until 70s, those broke down. So clearly, there was a link between a certain kind of political economy that had been experimented by the Chinese state uh, until then with the kind of public health it was providing. So that shows that we need to create other kinds of surpluses in a larger social space, which can then be deployed for a larger social purpose like public health, which is something that we are missing. And what we do is, it's an either or kind of uh, 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 question. So if we are not able to do it from collectivized agriculture to public health, then we move straight out of that into privatized realms of both agriculture production as well as health production. So there is that very big gap between that transition, uh, in that transition between the two models, which is where we need to locate our questions. And I think that uh, that is something that we in India need to do. We are doing, many of us uh, you know, are exploring these possibilities on the ground. And I think uh, our academic discourse is really much slower always to catch up with what is on the ground. I have a feeling that that possibility may exist in China. I don't know. I've never done field work, not studied it so closely. So, but I just wonder if that space is something that we could uh, we could uh, explore. I'm particularly emboldened to say this because you have been talking about exploring the comparative studies, and you know, I do think that it's so important. Um, who knows? I mean, this is something we may be able to do. Uh, that's uh, one thing I wanted to say. The second thing, of course, uh, that's the other vantage point that I uh, uh, bring. My study has been on uh, traditional medical knowledge systems for, uh, that's what a lot of people know it as, and therefore I use that term uh, simply as a point of reference so everyone knows what I'm talking about. I do not like to call them traditional medical knowledge systems anymore, uh, but this is not the space to discuss why and uh, what I call them instead. But what I'm interested in talking about is that I know that this book is not about uh, the traditional Chinese, system, uh, Chinese uh, medical system. Uh, but this uh, trajectory of commercialization is exactly what has been happening in, the, in what they call uh, TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. I studied a little bit of it because when I was studying Ayurveda and looking at it in terms of the global uh, context and how Ayurveda has commercialized, my work is on the standardization and commercialization of Ayurveda. There, I, ha I do have a section, I have to humbly uh, uh, you know, allude to that, uh, uh, because there I find, and this is where is the interesting comparative point that I made 10 years ago, uh, between India and China, that we've approached the major project of the modernization of our traditional knowledge systems in two completely different ways. The Chinese, Given that their medical knowledge system was an intrinsic part of their revolution, of their entire revolutionary mobilization, you know, it was part of the long march, it was part of all the initial primary health care systems, the idea of the barefoot doctor comes as much from the practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine as they did from the modern doctors who went and worked uh, on the ground. And the two uh, uh, civilizations enjoy a very uh, deep uh, engagement and it's, it's not engagement, it's a part and parcel of the civilization, the kind of knowledge system, medical knowledge systems we've had and we've lived with uh, for so uh, very long. Um, for China, the modernization was about creating common parameters between TCM and biomedicine. And using that commonality of parameters to co-locate, what we have called co-location in uh, you know, policy uh, from the NRHM that happened only a few years ago, this is 
uh, this was the focus of the Chinese right from the beginning. Uh, they uh, they uh, co-located and all, all hospitals which you know you're talking about always did have you know the uh, traditional uh, practitioners and patients had the choice to go to either and sometimes there were actual collaborations between doctors uh, to decide on a, a patient to see what medical uh, system, what medicines, what uh, uh, treatment uh, system regimen would suit the patient's condition better. Uh, that would actually decide what kind of health care the patient received. So this was a very remarkable example and uh, for us in India it was, uh, I mean I found it really fascinating. Uh, which contributed towards several things, not only equity and so on that you've been talking about, but also about putting different knowledge systems that purportedly come from tradition and modernity and where we see them always in conflict with each other, they actually made an effort to put them at par. However, my uh, biggest discomfort with this whole process was that the epistemological parameters of <coughs> TCM were made to compromise. And this is a very uh, you know, a difficult and complex and contentious thing to say, but this is my understanding that they, and this is my understanding that I derived from anthropologists who worked on traditional Chinese medicine, that they were expected to conform to the parameters of biomedicine. Uh, whereby they actually went to uh, went on to adopt the diagnostic tools, the treatment regimens, and thereby also the entire medicine, you know, the actual medicines that were available to TCM uh, were transformed to the standardized medicines <coughs> of biomedicine. In India, it was completely different. This thing happened, but this was not the imperative of policy. The imperative of policy in India was very different and the understanding was that the epistemological parameters of each and every system in India would be respected and they would be expected to uh, function within that. Very little support came from the state and so on, uh, but that, this is not the space to talk about it. But what happened was that when all of these systems entered commercialization, and that's the point I want to talk about, when they come into the whole trajectory of commercialization, then the manner in which traditional Chinese medicine commercialized actually was cast completely in the commercialization framework of biomedicine. And if you read the reports today, I mean, it is the international, and for a large number of reasons in the last 25 years, the international market for so-called herbal medicine has exploded and lots of new entries have come into this. The traditional Chinese medicine manufacturers are the biggest uh, participants in this, and not more. And very recently, the president gifted to the WHO headquarters in, in, in Geneva the statue of a human body with all the acupuncture points, acupressure points on that body, as a way of saying, look, this is the system that is truly Chinese, and this is something that we identify with. This is something that's very significant. Across the world, people have begun to accept it, follow it, practice it. So WHO better give it that recognition and space and include it in its, in its a, a main uh, WHO health report and not keep it in the traditional medicine uh, report that it has been doing since 2002. So this commercialization is happening parallel to the commercialization that you're talking about. And somewhere, I think we really need to understand why and how this is happening. How the two influence each other if they do at all. Because we know that a lot of cross-sectoral influence is happening in India. I think that this holds a key to understanding why, for instance, they are able to keep out-of-pocket expenses at a certain level. We don't know how much of that 
you know, and we are, whether we are calculating how much of that is going into TCM, etc. I think these are the interstices of your argument, which would be very fascinating to explore uh, from here on now. And so I think that, you know, given that when we talk about TCM, just one other point, which also links to something that Professor Kadi said, that when we talk about health, Roti Kapra Makan is health. It's a very, very, very important point that she's raised, and I really would like to allude to that, that traditional knowledge systems do not talk about health as medicines. They talk about nutrition. They talk about the way you lead your life, the work you do, and if you are sick, what medicine you have. So in that sense, those are knowledge systems which have a, a huge space in which to accommodate very contemporary ideas, because that is where they come from. So I'm not saying that we are fitting contemporary ideas into them. If anything, they have those ideas which actually blend with contemporary understanding of public health. And so these are spaces that are very much available to us for exploration. So some substance of what I, what I felt uh, at the end of reading the book was that, wow. So they've made a start. And we have a long way to go, lots to do. Thank you so much for this and the potential. Well, uh, thank you very much, Madhuleka. Uh, she's uh, written part of our agenda for the future. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, pointed to something very, very important, both from a comparative perspective and in terms of what is not addressed here, uh, which would be uh, something, something else to consider. Now, uh, I'm wondering whether to uh, make any comments or rejoinders or uh, responses to the comments made, including, of course, Professor Mahati's uh, foreword, which you will read already. I want to thank both of you, and, I, and I'm really very um, grateful that you have read the book so thoroughly, both Imrana and Madhulika, because I think uh, what Imrana said was very right. It's a thin book, but it's a heavily packed book. And, I, and when I read it after it was published, I felt the same way. <laughs> but I also um, decircumscribed our focus to medical care. And, and I think when, as we were trying to understand the reform process, we found that there was something which was fundamentally different between the Indian and the Chinese approach to reforms. And that was course correction. And the course correction was guided by the, you know, the principles of equity, that they were constantly concerned about the question of equity. So the course corrections were very much around that. But the trap there was they had gone in for a insurance, social insurance model which was extremely hospital focused. So in that process, it was the cost question that made them do relook at strengthening primary level care with public investment. So we saw in the last four years, for example, this continuous discussion of how they need to refurbish and reinvest in their community health centers in the urban and in the rural areas. So it was very interesting that even this uh, the, the logic of keeping the out-of-pocket expenditures led to the strengthening of, or at least trying to reinvest in primary level care. And the other thing which you raised, and I, and I really think that it is very, very interesting when you say, you, you said, how do you understand commercialization and that are there different pathways uh, to this question of surplus as well? <coughs> Actually, what we have tried to do is, and it, it's becoming very clear in our work when we look at arrangements for older persons care in China. And I think that's where the greatest amount of innovation is happening in terms of both partnerships and in the way commercial interests are being geared towards, the, you know, in, in municipalities. We've looked only at Shanghai, where they are using commercial interests, but for a municipal municipality gain, meaning there's a collective understanding of the needs of the poor, of the older persons, and they also have a graded understanding of the needs of older persons. So what they are trying to do, which we of course are nowhere, we are, we are actually non-starters on this issue, 
um, is how the health services speaks to social care. And I think, and their social care is not all government funded social care. So they are, you know, looking at other ways of arrangements. And even their public private partnership institutions for institutionalized care are done in a very different manner. I mean, and that is something we are going to work on in the next few years. TCM has been a very, very interesting case, and it has raised many questions. And I remember when I came back once and having a conversation with Ritritu, I said, that's a whole area that needs to be explored. Because you're right, there is commercialization of TCM, but a lot of the questions that you were asking, we saw co-location. We, we saw a lot of older persons coming in for, say, an intravenous drip. That seems to be a favorite yeah. in uh, China. But they would also go to the um, TCM. And when we saw end-of-life care, we saw the interaction between TCM and biomedicine quite uh, significantly, especially in pain management and things like that. But this was like more on observational visits. We didn't really work on it. But please, come on board into ICS. All those who are interested in TCM, I think we can do a lifetime of work on it. Because I think the questions that we need to ask have to be discreet. And then, you know, if we are able to sort of form a group that would ask questions that interest them, I'm sure we will create a body of knowledge which would be extremely valuable for comparative work. And I just want to say thank you both so much because they were extremely insightful, engaged comments. And I really enjoyed both your interventions. Uh, and of course, Professor Mohanty, he has mentored us right through. I think we passed our manuscript through him. And if I'm not mistaken, he's probably the reader of our manuscript. <laughs> and he wrote the foreword. Um, but the only additional thing I want to say is that there is one person, you see, the, there was a, the, the Americans have been the reform watchers for a long time. And there was one person, Dr. Lincoln Chen from Harvard University, mm -hmm. whom I had sort of written to when we first wanted to work on China and said, could you please give us a couple of contacts among the Chinese scholars? And he was very gracious to do that. But after we wrote the book, we sent the manuscript to him. And he wrote the prologue for this book. Mm -hmm. And because it seems his dream was to build India-China comparative, which he never succeeded in the years that he was in India and later in China. And he said, there's a disaster that's waiting to happen in China, but we are, none of the American scholars are willing to actually write on that. They're write, willing to write on public hospital reform, but they're not willing to write on the growth of the private sector and what it is doing to the Chinese health services. So I really am um, very grateful that he wrote the prologue for us. Mm. Thank you. Um, Mother. Thank you, Professor Banerjee and Professor Kandir. The comments were really uh, very substantive, and uh, thanks for reading the entire book so thoroughly. Um, I would just like to reiterate what uh, Rama just said about the whole rectification and course correction process that the Chinese have gone through, and it started in the early 2000s. Um, so, I mean, the out-of-pocket did go up to 60% at that time, and that was the maximum that it went. And then it actually, within two decades, they were able to bring it down to 30%. And that is the, uh, I think, uh, the main uh, argument that we make, that they are also trying to do these post connections through various uh, ways and uh, trying to keep up with this question of equity. And uh, as well as the point that uh, this uh, course correction itself has uh, been, uh, I mean, not, I mean, in a sense, like it has not been sustainable, or will it be sustainable? Is the question, because the whole commercialization process has taken a um, a turn that is, in a sense, we feel like irreversible, and it's going further and further deeper into uh, uh, the health sector. Um, further, uh, I mean, of course, the TCM argument. I mean, that's something that comes up in every question and debates that we have. Like, where does the TCM you know, locate itself in the health sector reforms itself. And, uh, and that's something we have always said, like, we need to do that because that's one of the major components of the health sector there. And a lot of, I mean, almost 60 to 70 percent of the pharmaceutical industry is devoted to the DC. So that's something that we definitely have in our agenda for the future. Um, 
Yeah, apart from that, I think the out-of-pocket expenditures, if I come back to that, I mean, the pro uh, provincial disparities definitely are the ones that are, like, stark. I mean, even if the maximum is 34% out-of-pocket expenditure, you have very low in Shanghai and Beijing, and that, I think, comes out clearly in the data that we present. Um, so that is where, and, and then also what Professor Kavir observed, that the employee insurance is what gets, gets the maximum uh, you know, benefits. So in a sense, we don't know. It averages out the thing as 30 percent, but we don't know how much migrants are paying and how much the employees are paying. So obviously, it's much negligible for the employees, but the uh, people who are in the informal sector are paying much more. So yes, we plan to take our work for forward. And thank you so much for your comments. And to Professor uh, Mohanty, too, who has written the forward, and to Patricia mm -hmm. for chairing. Well, uh, we would love to open this up, but I think it uh, <coughs> is scheduled for outside of the tea, tea time. Um, so I think uh, this has been a very rich session. It may be a small book, but it's a very meaningful book, not just for ICS, for your center, but uh, for all of us citizens here and now. Um, I think the, uh, the lessons that I draw from the comments and the book itself is that first of all, uh, you have a focus on China, but the story cannot and does not stand alone. I think this is an important point of Imran made, that when you can say, oh dear, you know, the out-of-pocket expenses have gone up, but what about here where we are? <laughs> what, what, what's happened? Uh, we have to keep that comparative uh, 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 aspect in mind, uh, as well as drawing lessons for transformation of all welfare states, uh, the medical systems in all welfare states. Uh, a second thing that came across uh, very uh, strongly was your point about the TCM, and uh, your rejoinder or uh, addition to that, that uh, perhaps when you're dealing with aging populations, this is something that you need to be looking at very carefully. And if I remember earlier work of Madurimus that I've written about the combination of the, um, the uh, Indian, uh, Indian medical systems and the biomedicine, it's not a very happy mix mm -hmm. in the Indian context of the practice. So um, there, there is a lot to be learned and thought of sure. here uh, going ahead. Um, I'd also like to compliment them, which came through also in your uh, final comment, uh, on the quality interaction they had and worked on and will no doubt continue with Chinese colleagues. Uh, we often find there is a bamboo curtain that uh, we can't penetrate very easily uh, uh, when dealing with uh, uh, questions of this nature. And I think that many, not only uh, you yourselves, but your, uh, we have a young woman working in the Harvard Yenjin project who has taken this into the field of missionary education and so on. So very important uh, interactions have been worked out with Chinese institutions and Chinese uh, academics in this field. And I think that that is something that we should feel that you've really pioneered on behalf not only of all of us in ICS, but of this country and our academic establishments within this field. Um, I should also say that um, uh, this is not the only work this redoubtable uh, pair have been doing. Uh, they have recently, uh, for ICS, uh, for a project, uh, completed a project on the uh, Indian doctors or in China, or rather the fate of Indian doctors returning from China, very important question with practical yeah, implications. Um, Madhuri Marin, her own work, as a complete sideline, has looked at not, you know, we're looking at China, and then we're looking at rural, and then we're looking at other then we're looking at the big, big cities, and then the the uh, second and third tier so cities. But she looked at, uh, uh, worked on our project on the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar uh, uh, dialogue uh, initiative and uh, had some very interesting comments to make 
within a regional context. I think this is something that needs to, you know, uh, germs don't stop at borders. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there, you know, there is a whole area, if you like, which is uh, have, uh, facing the same problems, where you could have very important regional dialogue. Uh, one of the things she brought out here was the something which uh, she brought up five, five years ago, maybe, but is now sort of hot potatoes. Uh, that is drug re TB, uh, drug resistant TB drugs, and this is a regional problem in that particular uh, region of Northeast India, Myanmar, Southeast Asia, and Southwest China. So there are a lot of uh, lessons to be learned from that. Um, so um, uh, altogether one's come away with a lot to think of and my only, only little um, uh, sort of, um, um, you know, the many questions in my own mind just from my own reading and understanding. When I was doing my PhD I worked alongside a woman who was working at a very funny interface on the medical, the family medical firm, that is private, you know, like Dr. So-and-so's clinic, where all the marriages in the family are from the anesthetist to the gynecologist to the, you know, this and that. So that whole businesses are set up, private businesses, which are family firms. So if we generalize the private sector as corporate, we, or as pharmaceutical industries. We're not looking out the windows around our own suburban location in Delhi or in any city in India at Mr. Sherma's you know, <laughs> clinic <laughs> where you have a bit of, bit of everything and the family is the firm. And that, of course, brings us into another sort of discussion of the private sector in India and uh, so on. Uh, which I would be very fascinated to know if after their coming through socialist medicine to now a different regime uh, and having in a way uh, dismantled the family in some respect and not in others, uh, whether we are seeing anything comparable. But uh, I invite you all to tea. Thank you very much for a you know, very, very interesting discussion, both of you and to your centre uh, for your cooperation with ICS and IIC for enabling this as well. We have a long way to go and the road is ahead is really interesting. So thank you for your inputs and thank you for this small but meaningful book. Thank you.